Oh, good morning, good afternoon, um, or good evening, wherever you are. Uh, today, uh, we're very pleased to have uh, Bhargav at in uh, Matrix Online Seminar. Um, so Bhargav received his PhD from Princeton University in 2010 under the supervision of Isa de Jong, uh, was a postdoctoral assistant professor in maths at the University of Michigan from 2010 to 2012, then uh, went back to Princeton as a member of the Institute for Advanced Study for two years until 2014 when he returned to Michigan again um, as an associate professor and then became professor in 2018. Uh, so Bhargav's research focuses on commutative algebra and uh, uh, arithmetic geometry, especially on Pierre de cohomology. And he worked with Peter Schultz uh, on a theory of prismatic cohomology. He was awarded the uh, Packet Fellowship, the 2021 New Horizons in Mathematics Prize. And in uh, just last year, he was elected to become a fellow of the American Mathematical Society, and he also received the Clay Research Award. So we're very pleased to have uh, Bhargav today speak for us on algebraic geometry in uh, mixed characteristic. Just one more point. If you have a question, please type it in using the Q&A function. And um, during the talk, you can type those questions in and we'll allow you to, to uh, speak and ask your question in person. But please type it in first. All right, Abhagav, over to you. Um, great, thank you. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Um, so let me share my screen. Uh, great. Um, yeah, th thanks a lot for this invitation. It's really nice uh, to be speaking here virtually. Um, of course, it would have been really nice to have been in Australia, but here we are. Um, Okay, uh, so I would like to talk about uh, algebraic geometry in mixed characteristic. Um, and so, as uh, as Ian mentioned, uh, one of the things I've been doing in the past few years is working on this theory of prismatic cohomology. And uh, it seems to be connected to a few different topics in, uh, in math, uh, especially as far as the piadic numbers are concerned. Um, and so, my, one of the goals of this talk is to tell you a little bit about what the theory looks like, um, and then uh, how it sort of ends up uh, leading to uh, hopefully understandable results in uh, in a few different areas of math. Um, okay, and yeah, so I would I would highly uh, encourage you to ask questions. Um, I'm very happy uh, to pause and uh, clarify anything. Okay, great. Uh, so let me begin with some motivation, uh, which is my at least for me that was one of the original motivations for pursuing this um, this project. Um, and so let me fix the prime number p actually for the rest of the talk. Um, and we'll see the relevance of p in a moment, but let me begin with something more classical. So let me begin uh, in Hodge theory. So let's go back to the work of uh, Hodge and Durham. So, so almost a century ago. Um, and they gave us a tool for understanding uh, the cohomology of, uh, of certain complex manifolds uh, geometrically. Um, and so here's how I want to recall what they, uh, what they taught us. So let's say X is a compact complex uh, Kähler manifold. And so the typical example relevant for this talk is uh, a complex submanifold of projective space. Uh, something that's cut out by homogeneous polynomials, uh, the zero locus of a bunch of homogeneous polynomials in projective space. Um, and so in this context, um, a sort of an important invariant uh, that one uses a lot in different kinds of geometry is the singular cohomology of X with uh, complex coefficients. Um, so this is something that just depends on the underlying topological space of X. It does not care about the uh, complex structure on X, um, but it encodes a lot of useful information nonetheless uh, through uh, Hodge theory. And so what Hodge theory tells us is there are two different ways of describing this group, uh, and I will sort of use the composition of those two ways. So the first one is um, uh, you can describe it in terms of differential forms. So it's the Durham cohomology um, of X, uh, and maybe I write over C to indicate that it's uh, with complex coefficients. Um, so you look at um, differential forms on X with complex coefficients, you form the Durham complex, uh, and then you look at kernel mod images at every step. Um, but a more useful way for us is going to be 
um, the following. So, so this is the Durham part of this theorem. And then Hodge uh, gave us a way to understand Durham homology classes uh, more explicitly. So he gave a decomposition of this group. So it decomposes as the direct sum over i plus j equals n of subspaces hij of x. Um, and these subspaces um, uh, are the subspaces of Durham cohomology that are spanned by uh, differential forms, uh, which locally can be written in terms of i many dz's and j many dz bars. So since x has a complex structure, um, the statement makes sense. And then you just decompose them. Um, in terms of uh, DZs and DZ bars. And um, it turns out that there is a unique such representative uh, in any given Durham cohomology class. And these, these classes don't sort of talk to each other for different distinct values of I and J. Um, and so you get a description of this group uh, in terms of something that manifestly has to do uh, with the complex geometry of X, with the notion of holomorphic functions on X. And so it gives you some connection between um, a topological invariant of X and a holomorphic invariant of X. And this can be very useful. It can be used in both directions. Um, so for example, um, let's say you knew that you knew for some abstract reasons that X was simply connected. Uh, there were the fundamental group was zero. Then you would also know that uh, by the Hurevich theorem that H1 is zero. Uh, and this decomposition then tells you that H01 and H10 are zero. In particular, if you think about what H01 is, uh, uh, H10 is, um, that's exactly the subspace of uh, global holomorphic one forms. So these are holomorphic forms that are defined on all of X. Uh, they have no, no poles. Um, and therefore, if H1 vanishes, uh, then what this theorem tells you is that there are no non-zero global holomorphic forms on X. So that's some geometric property uh, of dependent on the complex structure of X, uh, which you can read off uh, from the topological side through this isomorphism. Um, you can also go in the other direction. Uh, so one easy, sort of the simplest thing I can say right now is um, uh, HIJ and HJI are complex conjugate to each other, right? I mean, DZ is, goes to DZ bar and a complex conjugation. And so therefore, if you're staring uh, at a value of N, which is odd, uh, then the sort of vector spaces that show up over here, HIJ and HJI, uh, they occur in pairs. Uh, so if HIJ shows, uh, has value N, you know, this is dimension C, then HJI also has dimension C, and moreover, I is not equal to J because I'm looking at N odd. And so uh, the dimension of the right-hand side is obviously even. Uh, and so what you learn uh, through this isomorphism is that the dimension of the left-hand side is also even which is a highly non-obvious fact, right? I mean, there's no reason that a certain uh, cohomology group had to have even dimension. Uh, it's something that's sort of strongly reflecting the complex structure here. Um, and so this was kind of my very uh, primitive attempt at convincing you that Hodge theory is useful. Uh, it sort of it gives you this nice connection between the topology of X and the geometry of X. Uh, what I want to focus on in this talk is a defect of this, uh, of this theorem. And the defect, from my perspective, comes from the fact that uh, we are using complex coefficients over here. And so we have completely thrown out all the torsion information um, in the cohomology of X. Because when cohomology with complex coefficients is cohomology with integer coefficients tensored with the complex numbers. And so you, just, you lose all the torsion information. And so the question I would like to understand is, can we somehow understand torsion classes on X uh, geometrically? Um, so let me just formulate that as a question. Uh, how to understand eight star of X. Um, so I could I could write torsion in the integral cohomology of X, uh, but it turns out to be more convenient and essentially equivalent to work with mod P cohomology instead. So let me let me simplify my life and do that. So essentially, if you understand mod P cohomology, uh, you understand the P torsion in integral cohomology, um, and so. Let's just focus on this simpler version of the question. How to understand eight star X FP geometrically, uh, meaning through some kind of a function theoretic object, something like differential forms. Um, now, obviously, uh, differential forms on the complex manifold are not going to help you. I mean, that's a complex vector space. You're not going to understand some P torsion object uh, in terms of a complex vector space. Um, but it turns out that there is actually a reasonable, not as there's a reasonable answer to this question, which is not quite as strong as the, hot, uh, as the theorem over here, um, as the as Hodge theory, but it still sort of goes a long ways in 
helping us understand this object better. And the goal of my talk is essentially to tell you about what this looks like. So answer, um, oh, sorry. And this answer only works in the algebraic case. So this is for X, a smooth projective variety. So I, I have no idea how to do what I'm about to say for uh, analytic spaces, which are not algebraic. So the answer I would like to convince you of is um, the following. So it's via differential form still, uh, but not on X, because as I said, that doesn't make any sense, but rather on X reduced modulo P. Um, and so I'll spend the next few minutes explaining what I mean more precisely uh, by, by this phrase over here, but that's kind of the slogan of, um, of where we're going. Okay, great. Uh, are there any questions so far? Sorry, I'm not monitoring the Q&A, so if, yeah, okay. All right, um, so let me now try and uh, make this uh, make, the, make the previous sentence more precise. Um, so I'm going to talk about what I'm going to call mod p Hodge theory, which is just a name I made up because it's p adic Hodge theory reduced mod p. Um, and so this, in order to make sense of this um, of this phrase, um, we need to be able to talk about uh, reducing x modulo p. Uh, it doesn't make sense to take a variety of the complex numbers, something defined by equations with complex coefficients. Uh, and reduce that modulo p because you know there's no there's no ring homomorphism from the complex numbers to a finite field. Uh, but there is a natural setting in which it makes sense to both reduce mod p and in, go to the complex numbers, uh, which is provided by the p-adic numbers. And so that's that's the setup in which we're going to be working. So here's the setup. Um, so z p is going to be my notation for the ring of p-adic integers. Uh, if you sort of haven't thought about ZP, uh, it's you're not going to lose anything in this talk by just pretending that this is Z localized at P, meaning you invert all the primes that are not P in the integers. Uh, so you're zooming in uh, near the prime P uh, in some geometric sense. Um, and so the, this is a really nice ring. It's a, it's a PID. It's a PID, which only in fact has two prime ideals, uh, the zero ideal and the prime P. And so there are the following things you can do to it. Uh, you can you can kill the prime p, and what you get is the finite field fp. But you can also invert p, and what you get is usually called the field of p-adic numbers, qp. Um, and since we're do doing geometry, uh, we want to go to the algebraic closure. So I'm going to go to qp bar. Um, and it turns out that it's better to complete this. So these, uh, the way uh, the p-adic integers are defined, uh, they are complete with respect to some topology. So QP has some natural topology for which it is complete, just like the real numbers. Uh, but its algebraic closure does not, because this is an extension of infinite degree, unlike what happens with the real numbers. And so it's better to complete it. And so let me do that. Um, and so this is what I'm going to call C um, in this talk, just um, to evoke the complex numbers. It's, if you like, it's the p-adic analog of the complex numbers. Uh, and it's, in fact, as a field, isomorphic to the complex numbers. Uh, if you believe in the axiom of choice. So it's really um, something we understand. Um, great. And so this is this is the base over which I'll work, meaning if I have some, you know, some polynomial over the integers, over ZP, I can reduce it mod P and I'll get a polynomial over FP. I can invert P and go over here and I get a polynomial over the complex numbers. So it's some kind of a glue that connects uh, Kirsik zero with Kirsik P. Um, and so this is the base. And then the geometric object is going to be called x, as before. So x over zp is something which is smooth and projective. Um, so it's kind of the nicest kind of algebraic uh, variety you could have over the p-adic integers. Um, and so the sort of concrete observables you get out of x are the following. So there's xc, which is just a smooth projective variety over the complex numbers, now p-adic complex numbers. So if you like, it's it's a compact complex manifold, um, Kähler even. Uh, and then there is also its mod p analog, uh, which is X, XFP. So this is smooth projective over FP. Um, and this, 
the rough heuristic is that we're going to make sense of this phrase, differential forms on x reduce mod p, as the differential forms on this space, x, uh, the mod p reduction of x. Um, and so if you like pictures, uh, sort of a standard picture that arithmetic geometers like drawing is something like the following. So you imagine X as some kind of a surface. Um, you imagine ZP, or rather its spectrum, as, as a curve. Uh, this curve only has two points, so it's a really wonky curve, but let's, let's not let that stop us. So there's a, there's a point corresponding to the field FP, and there's a point corresponding to the field QP. Um, and over those points, uh, there are these two fibers. So here's XFP and here's uh, XQP or XC if you like. And uh, the assumption that I made over here uh, that this map was, uh, that X is, is smooth and projective uh, essentially means that this map behaves like a, uh, this, I'm oh, sorry, there was a map I forgot to draw. Um, this is a surface fibered over a curve. And the assumption that we made uh, uh, on X implies that you should think of this as, as a submersion in topology. So it's a, it, 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 it's a fiber bundle, if you like, it's a, except it's a fiber bundle that relates something in characteristic zero to something in characteristic P. Um, so it's wonky in that, from that point of view. And so in this setup, uh, the, let me now try and formulate a precise answer uh, to this question uh, that I started with. So I'll, I'll just write down a theorem. It's not sort of the most general theorem or anything like that. I just want to give you a flavor for, for what happens. Um, and so I guess this is joint work from six years ago now with Mauro and Schulze. Um, and uh, let me first say in words what the theorem is going to be before I write it down. So we want some connection between this complex variety and this variety in Kersic P, or rather their cohomology groups. Uh, and the theorem is going to be that there is a one parameter family of cohomology theories. For generic values of the parameter, uh, we've got the singular cohomology of uh, x with mod p coefficients, meaning the object we're interested in. Uh, and for special values of the parameter, we'll get Durham cohomology of this uh, space over here. And so we get this kind of promised relationship between, um, between those two theories. Um, and so let's, let me just try to formulate that slightly precisely. So let's say A is going to be the following, following ring. Uh, it's the ring of uh, Laurent's uh, formal power series uh, in one variable uh, over the finite field FP. Um, and then the theorem is that there exists a cohomology theory attached to this situation, which is called prismatic cohomology, or it's some version of prismatic cohomology. Uh, it's a cohomology theory which is valued in finitely generated modules over this ring A. Um, so it's modules over a PID now, rather than modules over a field, um, uh, satisfying the following properties. Um, so for I said that for generic values of the parameter, you're supposed to get a singular cohomology of, the, of XC. And so one way to say that is if you invert U, uh, which is the only sort of interesting uh, thing you can do to this ring, uh, you end up getting this the singular cohomology of XC with mod p coefficients. Um, and then you have to account for the fact that the scalars are, are not quite right if I write this. So tensored over fp with uh, a with u inverted. So ignoring the fact that I, uh, exp I artificially expanded the scalars from fp to this bigger field, Laurent series, uh, I'm just getting the singular cohomology of, uh, of xc. Uh, but the interesting thing happens when you go mod u. So if I take Hn A of x, the nth uh, prismatic cohomology group, and I reduce it modulo u, so it's the opposite of inverting u, uh, then this is essentially Durham cohomology of the mod p fiber. Um, it's not literally that because there are some universal coefficients type problems, uh, but what you can definitely say is that there's an injection um, from here into the Durham cohomology of this mod p variety xfp. So we get the connection between the topology here and the differential forms here is what um, the existence of this theory is saying. Um, and so, okay, at this point you might wonder like, okay, so there's some theory that connects the two, but what information can you concretely get out of this? And so let me just tell you here, there's something super easy you can prove uh, using just A and B and um, linear algebra is the following. So it, uh, it's a dimension inequality. It says that the dimension over FP of the singular cohomology 
with mod p coefficients of the gear six zero fiber is bounded above by the dimension over fp of the drum cohomology of the gear six p fiber xfp. And so if you were interested in sort of understanding how pathological this object is, uh, how much mod p cohomology do you have on the on the gear six zero fiber? Uh, this at least provides you an upper bound. Uh, it says that it can't be any worse uh, than the amount of Durham cohomology you have on the mod P fiber. And that can often be useful because uh, there are sort of tools for computing this that would not be obvious on the other side. Sorry, Bhagav, there's a, there's a question um, yep. from Lucas Stapleton. Tom, can you let Luca in? Um, oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Okay, well, I'm not sure if that's working. But Sorry, the, the, so the question is uh, whether you can explain the definition of the RAM cohomology of X, F, or P again. Ah, uh, sorry. Okay. Well, I didn't explain it, uh, and it was something I wasn't uh, was trying to avoid. But absolutely, I can try. Um, so, um, I mean, the RAM cohomology is defined as soon as you have a notion of functions, right? You have you can if you have like the notion of a function and you have a notion of differential forms, uh, you can talk about differentiating the function and differentiating the form and so on. You build this complex and you look at its cohomology. Um, and so what Grotenbeek observed is that uh, if you're working on an algebraic variety, uh, you don't have to work with sort of all C infinity functions. You can just work with algebraic functions and algebraic one forms and algebraic two forms. Um, and so this gives you what's called algebraic Durham cohomology. And it has the advantage that it makes sense over any field. You don't need to be working in some analytic setting. Uh, it makes sense over a field of characteristic P, for example. And that's essentially uh, what I mean over here. So for affine varieties, um, this, is literal, this would literally be the definition uh, of this object. And then for non-affine varieties, there's a gluing procedure uh, to build this object. So technically speaking, I have to use the language of sheaves to do this. But this is what I mean. Does that suffice, Luca? Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, right, so this is actually like kind of the point I was trying I can just, yeah. Um, because of what I just said, there is a way to compute um, what this object is uh, if, you if you know what the equations of the variety look like, because it's entirely explicit in terms of the equations. Um, and so this provides you some way of upper bounding uh, what the left-hand side looks like. And I wanted to give some examples of how this could be used in practice uh, uh, next. Okay, um, great. So, right, so I was, sorry, I was, I'm about to get to applications uh, and I'll, I'll include one example of uh, how to use this uh, in a moment. Uh, but I just want, before I, maybe I start talking about that, let me, um, let me just say a word on uh, what, what this theory, so as I said, this theory is called prismatic cohomology and I'm not gonna give you a construction of this theory because that would somehow take too long. Um, but I will at least tell you that there are three different constructions uh, of this theory by now. Uh, there is an analytic one, which was maybe the first one, which was through the theory of perfectoid spaces. Um, there's a topological one, uh, which is through homotopy theory. And this was kind of slightly surprising maybe, and I'll try and come back to this uh, 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 in the talk. Um, and then there's a third one, which is somehow the most powerful one, which is a pure algebra construction. Um, it's 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 using this notion of prisms, uh, which is where the name comes from. Uh, and that's somehow the most powerful. So since you have like an algebraic way of computing this object uh, through these other definitions, um, you can then use this algebraic way of computing it to prove new theorems. Uh, and I wanna explain one of these uh, new theorems uh, in the K-theory world. Okay, so let, 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 sorry. instead of just blabbing, let me actually write something. Um, so here are some sample applications. Um, So maybe the simplest one actually is the is the following. So uh, this dimension inequality over here gives you a torsion freeness criterion. So it gives you a way to check whether or not um, there is a torsion in the singular cohomology, and it looks as follows. So uh, so the criterion says that if the dimension over the complex numbers of the usual Durham cohomology of the characteristic zero fiber XC equals the dimension over FP of the Durham cohomology 
of this mod p variety, xfp. Um, then uh, the singular cohomology, or uh, a tall cohomology, if you like, uh, of the characteristic zero fiber is torsion free. So, in other words, what this is saying is that uh, if you sort of don't see any extra differential forms in characteristic P that, uh, compared to what you saw in characteristic zero, then you also don't have any P torsion homology classes uh, on your space. Um, and so this this idea was used uh, in this recent uh, in a recent paper uh, um, by Colmes, uh, Daspinescu, and Niziol to actually do an interesting calculation, or um, to prove a torsion freeness result. And so what they proved is that the singular or etal homology of um, what's called the Drinfeld upper half space is torsion free. So, Berger, there's a question by Jordi Williamson. Um, uh -huh. Jordi, you should be invited as panel member. Uh, I, I can read the question, so I can try to answer. Jordi is not. So, okay, Jordi asks. Oh, Jordi is here. Okay, great. Yeah, he's here. You should be able to unmute Jordi. Sorry about that. I, I, it was just a simple question for the end, but you, you have this injection um, in B above, and you said that there was some kind of universal coefficient type theorem. Mm -hmm. um, and is it just the kind of obvious thing that you would guess, or is it more complicated? Yeah, it's the obvious thing. The next theorem is the U torsion in HN plus one. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for the question. Right, great. Um, so yeah, I wanted to mention this application. So here, uh, omega is what's called the Drinfeld upper half play, uh, space. Uh, it's a rather important variety in, in rigid analytic geometry, especially uh, for number theory applications. Um, I'm not gonna give you the definition, uh, but the way the variety is defined, uh, you, it's hard to actually compute what this object is, but it's relatively easy to compute what the mod P fiber is because it's defined through some uh, defamation problem that you have a good handle on. Uh, and so using uh, the fact that one can sort of compute this side and this side in this example, uh, they're able to deduce uh, the torsion freeness of uh, the singular cohomology of the space. And in fact, they go a lot, lot, a lot further. They actually compute what the cohomology exactly looks like. Uh, there are some natural groups acting on the situation and they compute uh, these objects as representations of these groups. Um, right. So that was uh, one of the applications I wanted to mention. Um, there are other sort of results along these lines where if you can compute, if you have some control on the mod P geometry of your space, uh, you can use it to get torsion freeness results. Um, the other one I wanted to mention was uh, something was to K theory. Uh, and historically, this was actually one of our first, um, um, this was the first construction of prismatic cohomology that we were looking for. It, it's, um, but let me present it as an application instead. So here's here's a theorem. Um, this was uh, this is sort of combining a little work of a lot of people. But um, at the end, uh, it's uh, Klaus and Matthew Morrow, and also the same three authors I mentioned before: uh, me, myself, Morrow, and Schultz. Um, and what, what the theorem basically says is that. Um, there is an analog of the atiyah Herzberg uh, spectral sequence for algebraic K theory uh, in this periodically complete world. Um, and so here's one way to formulate it, which is not going to be too technical. Um, so say R is some periodically complete ring. You can also do it with uh, more geometric objects, uh, but let me just stick to uh, commutative rings. So in this case, what the theorem says is that there exists a filtration on uh, the algebraic K theory of R with mod P coefficients. Um, and I will put in a small decoration over here, which hopefully no one will ask me about. Um, it's called the Atal K theory. So there's a filtration on the space uh, with graded pieces. Uh, uh, controlled, let, let me, controlled uh, via prismatic homology.
So in other words, what I'm saying is prismatic homology uh, plays the same role for uh, algebraic K theory in this biotically complete world that usual cohomology does for topological K theory of, uh, of um, topological spaces. So the idea of Herzberg's spectral sequence says that if you know how to compute the singular cohomology of a space, there is at least some recipe to compute the K theory of the space. The recipe could be complicated, but there's a recipe which is their spectral sequence. And um, I'm asserting something similar over here when you replace cohomology with prismatic cohomology and K theory with uh, algebraic K theory. Um, and so historically, this was actually one of our first constructions of, or this is the first construction of prismatic cohomology that we tried to produce. Uh, so we wanted to produce a filtration on K theory and then use that filtration to define prismatic cohomology through the associated graded. Um, that's not quite how things happen, but now that we have other ways of computing it, this theorem can be used to prove uh, new results on K theory because we have tools for computing prismatic cohomology. Um, and so here's sort of one, one sample result uh, that comes out of this. Uh, uh, this approach. Uh, so it's an analog of the bot vanishing theorem uh, in the setting of uh, um, algebraic K theory. It's a very weak analog because you don't actually, well, it's, you get an analog of the vanishing part, you don't get an analog of the periodicity part. So what it says is that the odd dimensional uh, uh, K theory groups with mod P coefficients, um, if you think, of them, think about them as functors uh, on commutative rings, uh, then they vanish locally in a certain sense. So the sense which is called syntomic. Uh, so syntomic topology was a topology that uh, Mazur invented. Um, I don't want to give the definition of it, but I just want to say how to think about this theorem. So in, in usual topology, uh, if you have a contractible space uh, and you look at its complex K theory, that just looks like the complex K theory of a point. And so the complex K theory of a point by bot periodicity is concentrated in even degrees. So the odd degree uh, K theory groups of a contractible space vanish. Uh, and this is saying something very similar uh, in the HAL context and the algebraic context that the odd degree uh, K theory groups can be uh, killed if you go, if you shrink your ring sufficiently to a sufficiently small object where shrinking needs to be measured in terms of this uh, exotic looking syntomic topology. Um, Okay, um, great. So there are other calculations of K theory that other people have done uh, along similar lines using, uh, using these methods, but I just wanted to give you some idea of, uh, uh, of what you can do with it. Um, I wanted to mention one more application, which is uh, to commutative algebra. Sorry, Bhagav, before you do that, is this a brief comment in, in the Q&A by Jordi? Ah, thank you. Absolutely, yes. Jordi points out that I didn't write odd, which is, of course, what I meant to write. Hopefully I said it. Uh, thank you. Um, great, so as, as Jan mentioned when he introduced me, uh, one of the things I do is commutative algebra. And this is in fact how I got uh, into uh, piadic geometry in the first place. There were some results in commutative algebra I wanted to prove and it seemed like ideas from piadic Hodge theory uh, could be useful here. And so the theorem I really wanted to prove ever since I was a graduate student uh, was the following. Um, and so I can finally report it here. Um, and so I will try to, this is a fancy uh, formulation of the theorem and there's elementary formulation of the theorem. And I'll, let me begin with the elementary one and then I'll tell you what the fancier one is. Um, so say R0 is just uh, a polynomial ring. ZP join X1 through Xn. Um, and then R is the ring I care about, so is a finite extension. So a finite extension just means that um, you take a finite extension of the field of fractions of R0, uh, which is just uh, you know some function field uh, over QP, and uh, look at the integral closure of R0 inside of R. Um, it's the obvious analog of a finite field extension in the context of domains. So as a finite extension of domains. So every element of R satisfies a monic polynomial of R0, and there's only finitely many generators uh, that you need. Um, any, yeah, this is a pretty, I mean, most rings have this property in this piatic world. Um, and then the theorem is that there exists a finite extension, a further finite extension, R to S, where something good happens. Um, and so the, the goodness is, is the following. So 
if you have a relation on the xi's, uh, summation ai xi equals zero in r mod p. So this could certainly happen uh, in a random ring. You could have some interesting relation like this. Uh, there are sort of the trivial relations uh, where which are of the form xi xj equals xj xi. So, I mean, those relations exist in any ring, but then depending on how complicated the ring is, you could have more exotic relations. Uh, and so the theorem says that there is a finite extension where any interesting relation will become trivial if you go up to the finite extension. So such that any relation summation AI X I equals zero and R mod P becomes trivial in the sense I was uh, mentioning verbally in S mod P. And so technically speaking, what I'm saying is that a certain a map on Kuzul homology groups is zero. So there's there's something called Kuzul homology, which measures uh, this idea of relations, modular trivial relations. And I'm saying that the map on Kuzul homology from R mod P to S mod P is the zero map. Um, and another way to sort of write this, which is maybe um, cleaner, is the following. So you take R plus to be the integral closure. So you go all the way to the biggest possible S you can imagine. So it's the integral closure of R in the fraction field of R, uh, algebraically closed. Um, so this is some ginormous ring. Um, and uh, this theorem that I just wrote can be reformulated as the statement that R plus uh, piadically completed is a Cohen-Macaulay. Uh, R module. So Cohen-Macaulay just means that the XIs uh, give you a regular sequence. There are no interesting uh, relations on the XIs when you go up to R plus. Um, and so this is sort of one version of the theorem, and this is essentially what it amounts to. Um, and so this is some completely elementary statement about commutative rings. I've written it down for you, and it would be really nice if there was some proof of this that doesn't use a lot of machinery. Uh, but I don't think I know such a thing. Um, and so this, the proof of this result crucially used prismatic cohomology, which is why I'm uh, mentioning it uh, in this talk. Um, there was a, right, so I wanted to make some remarks on this theorem, uh, two remarks. Um, so uh, the first remark was that uh, there's a mod p version of this. So here I worked with the p-adic integers and then I joined some variables. Uh, you could of course do this over fp itself instead of zp and sort of just work in equal characteristic p. Uh, and so that was actually a known theorem. Um, Uh, is due to Hoxter and Hunicke. And it's somehow one of the fundamental theorems uh, in what's called F-singularity theory. Um, so let me just say F-singularity theory over here. So this is some approach to understanding singularities of varieties in Kersey P uh, through the Frobenius. Uh, F stands for the Frobenius. It's been developed by Hoxter and Hunicke uh, over the course of many decades. And this was kind of one of the sort of important results um, in that theory. And so what I'm saying is that there is now a version of that theorem which doesn't, which works uh, integrally, so over ZP rather than uh, just over FP. And there's a crucial distinction between the two, which is that you don't have a Frobenius in the mixed characteristic world. So over ZP, uh, there is no Frobenius endomorphism, whereas mod P, there is always a Frobenius endomorphism. And so the Frobenius endomorphism plays an absolutely crucial role in uh, in, in this theorem over in Kersey P. And so what the prismatic uh, theory allows you to do is it allows you to mimic uh, some of these arguments from Kersik P uh, in this mixed characteristic setting, uh, because even though the ring doesn't carry a Frobenius, its prismatic cohomology always carries a Frobenius. Uh, this is sort of somehow how the theory is defined. Um, and so you get this kind of nice operator that acts on everything in mixed characteristic, uh, and you can use that to prove things. So that was one remark. And then uh, the other remark uh, I wanted to make was the, uh, some applications of this, uh, or rather some, it, this might, theorem might look slightly unmotivated uh, if you sort of are not a commutative algebra person. And so let me just mention uh, what it looks like in a more global context. So the global version of this theorem is essentially uh, the statement that uh, uh, there's something called the Kodaira vanishing theorem in complex geometry. Uh, and the Kodaira vanishing theorem in complex geometry is not true if you work in Kerasik P or in mixed characteristic. So it's, it's an the proof is analytic and it just completely breaks down. And in fact, there are counterexamples to the theorem away from Kerasik zero. Um, 
And what the theorem that I wrote down essentially is saying is that Kodara vanishing is true in these other contexts, provided you allow yourself to go up along finite covers. Um, so let me just write it this way. So Kodara vanishing up to finite covers. So you couldn't expect it on the nose, but um, it does uh, work out if you allow yourself these finite covers. And this is good enough for lots of applications. Uh, the way vanishing theorems typically come up in applications is you're trying to solve some geometric problem. Uh, and let's say you're trying to do an inductive proof where you've, you're trying to build some, you know, something like a section of some line bundle on X uh, and you know how to build it on a, on, a on a hypersurface by induction and you want to sort of lift it from the hypersurface to the, uh, to the variety, to the ambient variety. Uh, and usually uh, the way uh, these lifting problems work is that the, there's an obstruction to lifting it, and the obstruction to lifting a, a section uh, lives in a certain cohomology group. Uh, and Kodara vanishing uh, tells you that certain cohomology groups vanish, and so you can lift those sections. Uh, and this is a crucial ingredient in most of the applications of birational, most of the results in birational geometry over the complex numbers. Um, and what this theorem allows you to do is at, le is at least mimic some of those arguments away from Kersig zero. And so here's sort of one consequence uh, that comes out of it. Uh, so uh, this is uh, this was done by two groups of people. So I will not write out all the names because there's, as you see, there's too many of them. Let me just say verbally. So uh, it's myself, Lin Chuan Ma, Joel Patak Falvi, uh, Carl Schwed, Kevin Tucker, Joe Waldron, Jakob Wittajak, and then also independently uh, Takamatsu and Yoshikawa. Uh, and so what it says is uh, you can. Um, you can run the minimal model program uh, in um, in this mixed characteristic world. So the minimal model program is a is a process for simplifying um, uh, a geometric object uh, that works very well uh, in Kersig zero, and now we can do it in mixed characteristic, provided the dimension is small. So for arithmetic threefolds, so three is the upper bound on this. Um, with residue characteristic at least five. So that's a hopefully technical assumption. Uh, but the three is important because the proof also uses resolution and singularities. And so you're definitely stuck there. No progress to report there. Um, and so, yeah, so this, this theorem somehow cleared a bunch of stumbling blocks and it was only possible because of this uh, prismatic stuff I was telling you about before. And so I thought it would be appropriate uh, to mention it. Uh, in this talk. And so I just wanted to end by telling you one last application, uh, which is um, very recent. Um, and it was slightly surprising uh, to me. Um, so it's, it's an application in pure complex geometry, um, or I guess complex algebraic geometry. Um, it was, it concerns something called essential dimension. Um, and it's the following uh, uh, statement. Um, so. This is due to uh, Benson Farb, uh, Mark Kissin, and uh, Jesse Wolfson. And what they proved is the following. So let's say A uh, over C is a complex abelian variety. So it's a complex, compact complex torus, uh, which has an algebraic structure. And um, yeah, sorry, just that, yeah. Um, and P is a prime, which is sufficiently large. And so th this for abelian variety has an algebra, it's a group, so you can multiply uh, by uh, any integer. In particular, you can multiply by P. Um, and so multiplication by P from A to A is a map. Uh, it's a covering space of A, in fact, it's a finite uh, covering space. Uh, the fibers uh, look like the P torsion on A, so uh, they look like Z mod P uh, to the 2G. Um, so it's a very explicit uh, covering space. Um, and their theorem concerns the essential dimension of this covering space, meaning uh, the number of parameters you really, really need to define this object. Uh, and so what they say is that actually in this context, you really need the dimension of A many parameters to define it. So this cannot be defined, cannot be pulled back. Let me write it this way, pulled back, even by rationally meaning even just over a small enough open subset uh, from a smaller dimensional variety. So you might hope, for example, that maybe your abelian variety is a thousand dimensional 
but there's a map to a curve and a covering space of the curve such that this map on the abelian variety is pulled back from the map on the curve. And then you might say that, okay, this map I had over the abelian variety is not super complicated. It's actually just defined over a curve and then there was some artificial pullback. Uh, and what the theorem is saying is that that's not the case. You really need the full uh, dimension of A many parameters uh, to define the map. Uh, and so the theorem on, on its face sort of does not look like it has anything to do with the uh, cohomology. Uh, and the connection is very roughly that they convert um, the data of this map, uh, or it's easy to see that the data of this map is encoded in certain cohomology classes on A, um, mod P cohomology classes on A, and what they, use, what they do is they observe that uh, the prismatic methods allow you to show that certain mod P cohomology classes on A remain non-zero if you go to a small enough affine open inside of A. So it's some kind of a non-trivial theorem about uh, restricting cohomology classes from A to an affine open inside of A that gets used over here. Um, and so I thought this was a really kind of nice and surprising application. And so I thought I would mention it uh, over here. And I think I was supposed to talk for about 45 minutes, uh, which is roughly where I'm at. So instead of uh, telling you more, maybe it's better actually if I just stop here and uh, answer any questions you might have. All right, thanks very much, Vargas. So I'm just going to applaud on behalf of everyone here. Yeah, if you have a question, uh, maybe speak to Q&A or raise your hand and we can invite you in to the session. So there's a question by Tony Feng. So um, Tony, we should be able to invite you in. So please unmute and ask the question, Tony. Oh, hi, can you hear me? Yep. Uh, yep. Hi, Tony. I was just wondering about this curiosity theorem, uh, why why one kind of hopes for this result in the symptomic topology for atoll K theory as opposed to locally in the atoll topology or... or, or, or ah, what, that's because it's, it's false in the atoll, locally in the atoll topology. Mm -hmm. um, somehow, if you work in this mod P world, uh, the atoll topology is too coarse, right? Like there's this kind of well-known phenomenon that mod P atoll cohomology of varieties in characteristic P is too small. Uh, and one reason is that there are too few uh, etal covers in characteristic P. Uh, but what that also means is that there's going to be too few etal covers to sort of annihilate these cohomology classes. You really need some ramification uh, to annihilate them. So uh, what, what about like syntomic K theory? Is that? I mean, that's essentially, I don't know what you mean by syntomic K theory, but if you're asking if I syntomically sheafify K theory? Yeah. Uh, yeah, then, I'm asking then like, yeah, I mean, that's would... what this result is saying. Yeah, that a symptomic K theory would be in even degrees, right? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, any further questions for uh, Baga? There's a question by Arun Ram. Arun, we should be able to invite you in. Yeah, I just wanted to ask about a T I bought localization to T fixed points because I want to track torsion across that. Um, mm -hmm. uh, haven't thought about this, so I don't want to say anything for sure. Um, I want to say. Yes, there should be a version of uh, TIA bot localization in this uh, for the in the prismatic world. Uh, just because the only, I mean, I'm just trying thinking through the proof of uh, this localization theorem that I learned from David Truman, and I think all the ingredients go through. But I think that's all I can say on the on the spot since I haven't thought about it further. Great, thanks. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So, Jordy. Um, thanks for the great talk, Bhagav. I was just wondering, um, is there any possibility of a kind of sheaf theory underlying prismatic cohomology? So some kind of intersection, for example, intersection prismatic cohomology or anything like that? Ah, good question. Um, well, okay, I, I don't know. Um, Maybe the first, okay, so there's a first question along these lines, which is what is the notion of a local system in this setting uh, rather than, I mean,
mean, you're sort of asking about fancier sheets, and I'm just like, you can first ask what it look like for local systems. Uh, and there we do have a good answer now. Uh, so Drinfeld uh, wrote these papers recently on what he calls prismatization. Uh, and that essentially, this is some gadget that's designed to give a good theory of coefficients uh, in the setting for locally constant guys. So a vector bundle on Drinfeld stack uh, would be a good analog of a local system in this, uh, in this world. Um, now, I don't know how to sort of incorporate singular objects in this context. So something like intersection uh, IC complexes. Um, Yeah, sorry, I, I don't, I don't have any uh, anything useful to say right now. Thanks. Okay. Any further questions for Baga? Okay. So. I don't see any further questions um, anymore, Baga. Thanks again for, for a, a wonderful talk on behalf of everyone here in Australia and, and there's some overseas uh, participants as well. Um, thanks everyone for attending uh, today and we hope to see you again next month at the next installment of the Matrix Online Seminar. So bye for now. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Bye-bye.